Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the 20th webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. And you guys are really in, a treat, in for a treat today. We have such a great expert to share with you. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA. That's N-O-A-A. And for those of you that this is your first time, that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Dana Wasinic mendez from NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program in West Palm Beach, Florida. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in coral reef conservation, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Dana is coming to us from the land of the Seminole and the Miccosukee Nations. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure everyone can hear you. Hear our speaker, that is. However, there's a box where you can write questions, so familiarize yourself with that now. If you haven't before, well, you ask questions as we go, and I will keep track for Dana. We're also doing something new today. We'll have a poll, a few polls put throughout the webinar. Those are not going to take the place of our moderated Q&A, but it's something Dana wanted to try, and we are up for it. So let's see how it goes. If we don't get to your questions, we'll answer as many as we can. And Dana, I'm sure, would be happy to follow up with folks who have some burning coral questions that didn't get answered. All right, Dana, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome, great. I want to start off first by thanking Nicole, representing the Regional Collaboration Network, and Grace with Woods Hole Sea Grant, just for creating and coordinating this whole webinar series. Um, I have a son at home uh, right now, homeschooling because of the coronavirus school closures as well, like many of you are. Um, and we've joined several of these webinars with his friends and have just really loved them. So thank you guys for, for making these possible. And I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you all about NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and teach you about our amazing coral reef ecosystems. So as Nicole said, my name is Dana Wasinic mendez I'm based in West Palm Beach, Florida, um, but the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program is actually headquartered up in Silver Spring, Maryland, in NOAA headquarters. And I think some of my colleagues who helped me with this presentation and who work for the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program are actually online with us as well today. So they're going to help answer some of the questions that might come in from you um, by typing answers into that, that question box as well. So thank you guys in advance for being here, your support and your help. And so everybody, I want you to uh, put on your imaginary snorkel mask Close your eyes and envision yourself on top of an aqua blue tropical sea. And let's jump in and explore the coral reef together. So first things first, I wanna see how much you guys already know about coral reefs. And my first question for you is what exactly is a coral? Some of you may know this, but some of you may be, may be new to coral reefs today. All right. Well, is now going to put up um, a poll. That you're going to be able to answer. Okay, that is it's up. up. It's, this is what we were talking about, kids. So this is a little different than we've done in the past. So I can see a lot of you guys are just click right on the screen to the one you think it is. So the question, as you can see, is what is a coral? Do you think it is A, an animal, B, a plant, C, a mineral, which is another word for rock, 
Or D, is it all of the above? And I can't see your responses. So okay, well, they're, they're coming in. We've got about 60% of the folks on who have voted. So I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it five more seconds. Great. And then I'm gonna close the poll. All right, here we go. Let's see. And here's our results. So Dana, we have about almost 40% of people think it's an animal, 23% think it's a plant, 5% say mineral, and roughly a third say all of the above. Okay. Hey, good job, you guys, because the two majority responses win. If you chose either A, an animal, or D, all of the above, well, you're both right, and I'll tell you why. So, corals. Coral, it all starts with an animal called a coral polyp. This is a picture of a bunch of coral polyps connected together to make a coral colony. Corals exist in colonies composed of many physically connected, interdependent individual animals called polyps. Now, each polyp has a mouth that connects to its stomach. Fun fact, corals, those coral polyps both eat and poop through that mouth. Um, Corals also have arms called tentacles, and it uses those tentacles to defend itself. It uses those tentacles to catch food out of the ocean water surrounding it. And um, it also uses those tentacles to keep itself clean and brush away debris and dirt. Now, if we were to look inside of a coral polyp, this is what we would see. We can see that opening, that mouth, you can see my arrow pointing to the mouth that connects down to the stomach. And you can see those tentacles. Now those tentacles have some special stinging cells in them that are called nematocysts. Most corals feed at the nighttime and they use those stinging cells to capture their food out of the ocean water. If you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you have encountered a nematocyst, a stinging cell. Corals have those too. Now, as I said, coral polyps are connected to each other. They depend on each other. They live in a colony together. These here on the left and the right of the coral polyp we're looking at are other coral polyps, and you can see they're connected with live tissue. So that is the coral animal. Now, I said if you chose answer D, all of the above, which would include minerals and plants, that you were right too. And so there are plants involved here, but probably not the kind of plant that you're most familiar with, either in your house or outside or in the favorite park you like to go hiking in. The plants that are involved with corals are teeny tiny microscopic algae called zooxanthellae. And zooxanthellae live within most types of coral polyps. You might be saying, Zuzan, what, Dana? I know that you can all say this. So let's practice. Please say it out loud with me right now. Let's say zoo, zan, fell, e. Zoo, zan, fell, e. Zuzanthelli, I'm sure you all said it perfectly. Good job. Now, Zuzanthellis and corals have a really tight relationship. They have a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Repeat that, mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Many of you may have learned about the concept of symbiosis in your science classes. Let's see how many of you are familiar with the term symbiosis. I have another poll for you guys. All right, poll let me launch going. And then you read the options as I launch the poll. Okay, okay, go ahead. So what is symbiosis, everybody? Is it a game on Nintendo Switch? Is it B, a song by the Jonas Brothers? Or could it be C, the interaction between two organisms that are living closely together? What do you all think? 
Okay, everybody. I know a few of you guys had um, trouble clicking the last poll, but it looks like um, I've heard from a few that other folks um, have been able to do it this round. So please try again. Um, I think, and then when I'm hearing, if you can't vote, please put your stuff in the chat box. That's great. Um, we've got about 60% voted. So everybody get, I'm gonna give you five more seconds to get your vote in. Um, I think you only fooled a few people, Dana, with your answer choices. Let's see. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. We had one or two people think it might be a game on Nintendo Switch, but 97% of the folks who voted said that it's C. Well done. Hey, and maybe it is a game on Nintendo Switch that I don't know about, but I can't, I can't trick you guys easily. You're right. Number C, the interaction between two organisms living closely together is what symbiosis is. Now, I had said that corals and zooxanthellae have a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. It's because there's a few different kinds of symbiosis. Two organisms living closely together can help each other out or they can hurt each other too. Parasites are an example of a symbiotic relationship. A dog and a tick live in a symbiotic relationship with each other, where the tick is the parasite and the dog is the host. Now, the tick gets a lot of benefits because it gets blood from the dog, but the dog does not benefit at all. It is not a helpful relationship for that dog. A mutualistic symbiotic relationship, like corals and zooxanthellae have, are where both living creatures benefit. So both the coral and the zooxanthellae get something positive out of living together. Another example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship that some of you may have learned about in your science classes is the clownfish and the sea anemone. They both get something positive out of that relationship from living together. The clownfish get protection because they live within the tentacles of the sea anemone which also has nematocysts or stinging cells. So any bigger fish that might wanna come in and snag a clownfish for lunch is not going to want to get stung by those tentacles. So the clownfish gets protection. What does the sea anemone get? The sea anemone gets cleaned out. The clownfish are constantly cleaning debris that may build up within those tentacles and would prevent the sea anemone from using those tentacles to catch the food that it's need, it needs. So let's talk about the mutualistic symbiotic relationship between zooxanthellae and corals. And you can see in that picture on the right hand side, you can actually see those microscopic algae living within that coral polyp. So zooxanthellae benefit from that relationship because they get a place to live. And the coral provides the materials that zooxanthellae need to conduct photosynthesis because they're plants, they photosynthesize. And hopefully some of you have learned about photosynthesis in science class, which is the process where plants take light from the sun and turn that into energy and food. And zooxanthellae are no different. They photosynthesize and take light from the sun and turn that into energy and food. Now, what does the coral get out of this relationship? Well, the zooxanthellae provide oxygen and essential nutrients for the corals. And they are actually what give corals all of their beautiful and amazing colors. Without zooxanthellae, they would just be transparent polyps. You could see right through them down to their white skeleton. But all of those beautiful colors that we see on a coral reef are created by the zooxanthellae. Now, <clears throat> zooxanthellae are pretty particular. They like water that is just the right temperature, not too cold, not too hot, and that is crystal clear so that they can get that sunlight to photosynthesize. And when zooxanthellae are not happy, we're gonna show you a little bit later what can happen. Um, and so I want you to think about that and think about what might happen when zooxanthellae get unhappy. So with that, I think we're gonna, we're gonna take a pause and see if there are any questions coming from you guys before we move on to talk about how those teeny tiny polyps build giant coral reefs.
So Nicole, any questions from our students? Uh, yeah, we have a couple. And uh, since we're breaking now, if you guys want to write one in the chat box, uh, let me know. Uh, Quinn would like to know, can corals be all different colors or are they all the same color? I think we're going to get to that. They can be all different colors. Yes, and in a little bit, I'm going to show you some pictures of how corals can not only be all different colors because of the different zooxanthellae that live within them, because there's different kinds of zooxanthellae, just like there are different kinds of corals, um, but they can also be all different shapes and sizes and grow at different rates. So we're gonna we're gonna get into that in a minute. Oh, um, and if you want, you could you can minimize your slides right now for this part if you want to just. Oh sure. Yeah, so we can see you a little bigger. Um, how big do, can corals get? Connor and Daniel would like to know. Oh boy, they can get really big. And again, in a second, I am gonna show you guys the biggest known coral colony in the world right now. I don't want to ruin the surprise, but. Okay, that's a good point. We should save They it. can be pretty large. Okay, um, and we're gonna talk about, so the folks who are asking lots of great questions about corals, I want you to know Dana is super prepared. She's gonna get to some of those. Um, Lydia wanted to know, do you only study corals? Um, so the cor I work for the Coral Reef Conservation Program and we focus on coral reef ecosystems. Now coral reef ecosystems include creatures other than corals. They include other important habitats like seagrass beds and mangroves and all of the different creatures that live in a coral reef, which I'm also gonna talk about in a couple minutes. Um, but NOAA as an agency studies and works to conserve and protect and support the management of all different ocean ecosystems, um, coral reefs being one of them. But that corals are, are the focus of the Coral Reef Conservation Program and my job. And in particular, I work in the Caribbean Atlantic region. I work with Florida, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and, and lots of other Caribbean countries as well. Okay, I have a very good, I'm gonna see if I get my pronunciation right, from uh, Gabe wants to know, if the zooxanthellae escaped in one area of the coral reef, would the whole reef be clear? So the zooxanthellae um, exist in each individual polyp. And so if the zooxanthellae escape from one polyp or one colony, it that, that colony will look white. And we're gonna talk about the concept of Coral reef, coral reef bleaching a little later, which is what that is called. Um, but you will see that in the same coral reef area, you will find some colonies that turn white and bleach, and some colonies where the zooxanthellae don't leave, they stay. And those corals can be right next to each other. And so scientists are trying to study right now why that happens and why some corals seem to be a little tougher than others. All right. Um, you have time for a couple more. A couple. Uh, let's take one. Let's take one more because I feel like a lot of these were, were okay. Two. Well, these ones are specific to you. If someone wants to know how long. Uh, Brenner wanted to know how long have you been working at NOAA and with corals. And then uh, Anya wants to know the favorite part of your job. Oh boy, cool. Um, well, I has I started in NOAA in two thousand and two. And I've always been working with coral coral reefs since I started with NOAA. I started working with Florida and the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And then we expanded and started working with some international partners in the Caribbean as well. So it's been, it'll be 18 years in October that I started working with NOAA. And I think my favorite part of my job is actually working with coral reef managers. And so the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program, a big part of what we do is work to study coral reefs and understand them, but also support the managers whose job it is every day to take care of coral reefs. And so I work with coral reef managers in the state of Florida, in the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and in many places in the Caribbean and try to do what I can do to help make their job easier so that they can protect coral reefs around 
around them, around their islands and around Florida. All right. Well, I think that's a great place to stop right now. And uh, you can put your slides back up and I will mute myself. Okay. Good questions, kids. Keep them coming. Yeah, great questions, guys. Thanks. So now we're going to talk about how those teeny tiny polyps can create giant coral reefs. Some of you may have heard about large coral reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which is the largest living structure in the world. And the second largest reef is really close to us in Mexico and Belize uh, called the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. And it also reaches down to Guatemala and Honduras. And so now we're gonna watch a little movie to help you guys see how those teeny tiny polyps can build massive reef structures. And it all comes down to a special material called calcium carbonate that the polyps secrete to create their skeletons. And guess what? Our bones are made of the same stuff, calcium carbonate. That's how we build our skeletons and that's also how corals build their skeletons. So let's watch and learn about how corals grow. Let's look inside a polyp to see how it helps build a reef. It takes carbon from algae and seawater and turns it into calcium carbonate. When you breathe, you exhale carbon dioxide. All animals do, including corals. But their carbon dioxide combines with calcium from the ocean to create calcium carbonate. Corals use this chalky compound to build their skeletons. Hard coral polyps push away from the surface on which they reside, then fill the gaps with calcium carbonate. Repeating this process over and over, they construct an entire reef. Corals can build up a reef at a rate of several centimeters per year. Speeding up time allows us to watch the coral community grow as individuals compete for resources on the reef. This slow, steady process can go on for a long time. Some reef structures are centuries old. Ocean currents and other factors can change the coral's shape. The same species can look quite different depending on something as simple as how fast the surrounding water is moving. We call this attribute plasticity. Coral's flexible response to their environment helps them adapt to a changing world. Okay, can everybody hear me now? I just love that video from the California Academy of Sciences that shows perfectly how corals grow. Nicole, can you hear me and see the PowerPoint again okay? Yes, you look great. Everything's great. good. Okay. Lots of people love that video. That's a cool video. <laughs> and you can find that on YouTube just by Googling how do corals grow because that's how I found it. <laughs> um, so as I said before, that corals can take so many shapes, sizes, and colors. And I just wanted to show a few of many, many examples of what corals can look like. There are actually over 800 different species of corals in the world's oceans. And I'm just gonna show you five of them right now. But so you can see how different corals can look and the different colors they can take. 
This is an example of a brain coral. There are many, many different kinds of brain corals. This is a pillar coral, which are tall, fuzzy columns with large polyps extending out into the water. There are branching corals like this one called a staghorn coral that looks like the antlers of a deer. And this one, another branching coral, is called elkhorn coral because it looks like the antlers of a, you got it, elk. And this is actually my personal favorite coral to see. It's a great star coral and they can be so bright and colorful. The polyps you can see in this one have neon green in the middle and you can see all different colors in the species. They're fun to find on the reef and see the differences between them. So even within the same species, corals can look very different. So now for that question about how big corals can get, I wanna introduce you guys to a special coral located in American Samoa named Big Mama. And you'll see how she got her name in just a second. So hold on. Make her big. Okay, are you all ready to see Big Mama? Here she is. Look how big this coral is next to all the other corals surrounding it and next to those scuba divers. Big Mama can be found in a special area called the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. Now, American Samoa is a US territory it's in the Pacific Ocean and it's south of the equator. In fact, it's the only place in the United States that is south of the equator. Big Mama is a Parites coral. She is over six meters high. That's almost 20 feet tall, you guys. She's really big. And she has a circumference. The measurement around her is 41 meters. And we think that Big Mama is the biggest coral in the world. Definitely one of the biggest, if not the biggest coral that we know of in the world. And we think it's taken her, we know it's taken Big Mama over 500 years to grow that big based on the rate at which Parites corals grow. So just take a look and appreciate her size. These are all corals growing around Big Mama here and here and here. These are all live corals, but she towers over the rest of that reef. So that's just to help you appreciate how long it can take corals to grow and how big they can get. So not just corals can be found on coral reefs. As, um, they are home to many other animals and creatures that depend on the coral reef as their habitat and their home. And I'm just gonna share a few examples with you of the thousands and thousands of creatures and critters that call coral reefs home or depend on coral reefs for some part of their life or may just visit coral reefs regularly as a source of food and habitat. Of course, there are lots of fish on coral reefs. Here's, this one is a humphead wrasse found in the Pacific. We have unicorn fish and grunts. Now the unicorn fish and grunts are special fish species called herbivores. And herbivores are animals, many of you know, eat plants. Now we talked about the zooxanthellae, which is algae that can grow inside of coral polyps but sometimes bigger algae can grow outside on top of coral reefs. And if they get out of control, they can actually harm corals and smother them and prevent that zooxanthellae from getting sunlight, prevent those polyps from feeding and cover them over and the corals will die. These herbivores are important grazers. They clean the coral reef of algae. That's what they eat, that's their food. We also have sharks on coral reefs. You can see a hammerhead shark and a black tip reef shark. These are the top predators of the coral reef ecosystem. And they keep the coral reef ecosystem in balance by controlling fish populations on the reef. 
manta rays can be found on many coral reefs. They are large, gentle giants. They open their big mouths and they're filter feeders. They swim through the water and their mouths open and catch small critters in the water. On top of corals, you can often find nudibranchs down here at the bottom and Christmas tree worms growing on top of coral colonies. Sea turtles call coral reefs home. You can often find sea turtles sleeping under coral reef ledges. Eels are also top predators on the coral reef ecosystem. Sea urchins, these long spindly creatures are another important herbivore. We need sea urchins on our reefs, although they are not fun to step on, they are important because they are herbivores and they move across the corals and clean that algae off of them. So they're really important. And then there's one final fish species I wanted to teach you about called the lionfish. And some of you may have heard or seen, heard about or seen lionfish. Now lionfish are native to the Pacific. That means that's where they were originally, that's where they're originally from. But lionfish were introduced into the Atlantic and Caribbean region. Probably we think from someone who had them in an aquarium and just decided they didn't want them anymore or couldn't take care of them, didn't know what they were doing and let them go into the ocean. Now in the Pacific, lionfish, because they're native there, have natural predators that eat them and that keep their populations in control. But in the Caribbean and Atlantic, there, there were no native predators for lionfish. And so the lionfish population grew and exploded and there's too many lionfish. And the problem with that is that lionfish like to eat everything they come across. They eat all of the juvenile and baby fish of so many different important reef species. And so managers and scientists and our partners working in the scuba diving community are helping us remove lionfish from coral reefs in Florida and in the Caribbean so that they don't hurt our populations of our other important reef fish, like those herbivores that we really need on the reef. Now, I wanna show you a really cool resource, and you may have seen the link to this resource in the webinar announcement, and I'll share the website with you at the end of the presentation. But if you go to the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program website, you can play around with this interactive reef. This is a Caribbean coral reef, and you can click on different creatures and different species of corals and learn about them. And so go to that webinar announcement, or um, you can copy down the email address when I get to that slide at the end of the presentation and play around with this interactive reef. You can click on the creatures and learn, for example, that sea turtles can hold their breath underwater for two hours. Bet you didn't know that. Here's that elkhorn coral we were talking about earlier. Elkhorn corals grow pretty fast. And unfortunately, they're, they're listed as threatened. That means we don't have many of them left. They're an important species for Caribbean and Atlantic coral reef ecosystems, and they're now protected legally. Caribbean spiny lobster live on the coral reef ecosystem. And many of you have enjoyed a tasty lobster meal, but did you know that they're nocturnal? and that they hide under corals during the day, but at night when many of their predators are asleep, they come out to eat themselves. So I'm gonna let you guys play around with this reef in your own time and learn about many other creatures on the that can be found on a Caribbean coral reef. So where are coral reefs? They can be found in many places actually mostly in tropical, some in subtropical waters. And these black dots on this map of the world represent all the places where coral reefs exist. Now they actually only cover a really small part of the ocean floor, not even 1%, a 10th of 1% of the ocean. But an ecosystem that covers such a small area of the ocean floor actually provides habitat for 25% or a quarter of all species living in the ocean in the world. So coral reefs are really important for marine species. We have lots of coral reef ecosystems in the, right in the USA. We have coral reefs here in Florida where I live. 
coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico in the Flower Garden Banks, in the U.S. Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico, which are territories of the United States, in the state of Hawaii, and in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, in American Samoa, where Big Mama lives that I showed you earlier, and in the territories of the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, or CNMI, and Guam. And we also have these really important areas called the Prias, or the U.S. Pacific Remote Island Areas, which have really beautiful uh, and important coral reef ecosystems. So coral reefs are not only important to all the creatures that live there, but they're really important to humans, to us. We need corals. In fact, a half of a billion people, 500 million people in 60 different countries depend on coral reefs for food, for jobs and income, and to protect our shorelines from hurricanes and big storms. I'm gonna share with you guys a video from the Coral Reef Conservation Program that shows all the reasons that corals are important to humans. So get ready for another video. Every year, coral reefs pump more than $3.4 billion into the U.S. economy, from the seafood we eat to the medicines we take. How does that happen? Although coral reefs cover only a tiny fraction of the planet, they support a quarter of all marine species. Many of the fish we eat spend some part of their lives here. Harvesting these fish supports thousands of jobs. Another benefit? The ability of coral reefs to reduce storm and wave energy. This protects the coastline, saving lives, livelihoods, and valuable coastal property. Researchers are also tapping coral reefs for new medicines to treat everything from cancer to arthritis. And let's not forget the role tourism and recreation play in the coral reef economy, attracting visitors who gladly pay for the opportunity to dive and snorkel among the corals. Reefs and reef fish even have a hand in creating the white sandy beaches we love. Our coral reefs are threatened, and so are the goods and services they produce. Climate change, pollution from the land, and harmful fishing practices top the list of threats. Fortunately, it is not too late. We can protect these remarkable ecosystems. Visit us online to learn about NOAA's coral reef conservation activities. Okay, so maybe now is a good time to pause and take a few more questions before I go into talking about the threats to coral reef ecosystems or the things that are harming and hurting coral reef ecosystems, what's being done to stop those threats. And then I wanna chat with you guys about what you think you might be able to do even if you don't live near coral reefs, to help coral reefs and to help keep them around for future generations. So do we have a few more questions? We do, and I'm gonna be really, this is gonna be a quick little run because we're um, mindful, I'm gonna be mindful of the time that we have left. For the folks who have specific questions about Big Mama, there is a link on the website where you signed up for the webinar that you can learn all about Big Mama. Um, and let's see, um, Ellie would like to know, do corals have a lifespan in and of themselves? Uh, yes, and it ranges per location and per species, but the oldest coral, one of the oldest corals we're aware of is, is Big Mama, who's over 500 years old. Okay, oh good, you answered an extra question there too. Um, do we have any idea of how many coral reefs there are in the world? Um, well, they're all different types of reefs. And so we have an idea of where the big reefs are, but that, that map I showed you earlier shows all the different coral reefs in the world. And as you can see, there were hundreds of dots on that map. 
Hundreds, okay. Um, can um, you talk a little bit about, so those corals are all naturally occurring coral reefs or are some of them artificial coral reefs? Um, Victoria is asking about, you know, things that people do to sink ships and different things to create artificial reefs. Um, yeah, great question. Um, those were all natural coral reefs, um, but in some places, um, we create artificial reefs or humans create artificial reefs. And so they sink ships or other things that can create habitat for fish in coral reef areas and also actually create habitat for corals that corals can grow on. And the good thing about artificial reefs is when you have a lot of people diving and snorkeling and visiting reefs, it can create a lot of pressure on a reef. And so putting down artificial reefs helps kind of balance out those visitors. And so some of them go to artificial reefs and some of them go to natural reefs so that not everyone is visiting the natural reefs at the same time. Great, thank you. And I wanna mention that um, Kyle, one of our speakers on Friday, will be talking about an artificial reef that was created uh, in South Carolina. So you might wanna tune in for that. Um, a few folks are curious about whether you are a diver. Do you do some of your work diving on these reefs? And if so, have you ever seen sharks? Um, I am a scuba diver. I got scuba certified actually when I was in college a long, long time ago, and I love scuba diving. My husband actually does that for a job. He's a scuba instructor, um, but I actually don't dive for work. There are NOAA science divers who go through a rigorous program in NOAA to become science divers and they do all of the coral reef science and monitoring out on the reef. And I work with coral reef managers. And so my job is primarily to provide support to coral reef managers and work with them to support their programs. Sometimes when I travel to cool places for meetings, I get to take some time and go on a scuba dive and enjoy the coral reefs, but I don't do it for work. Um, and Favorite thing to see, oh no, you asked if I see sharks. Yes, I have seen lots of cool sharks. One of my memorable encounters with the shark was in Palau, which is an island nation in Micronesia in the Pacific Ocean. And I swam into a cave and a large scalloped hammerhead shark followed me into that cave. And it was a pretty cool experience that I had with me and my coworkers and friends who were who were diving with me. Wow, that sounds exciting. We, um, I just you you queued up something really um, that I wanted to remind folks of. One is that we did talk about sharks last week with Chris Flight. So if you missed that webinar and want to see something about sharks, you can go on our YouTube channel and uh, find that one. And also, we have the NOAA Dive Program is going to be joining us on June eighth. So um, some of the divers that uh, Dana was just talking about, we'll be, we'll be talking with them. So you can mark your calendar. All right, Dana, back to you. Okay, cool. Mm. Okay, so we talked about how important coral reefs are. Now I wanna talk about how in trouble they are. We have actually already lost half of all of the coral reefs in the world, 50% of them. And if we don't do something now to change that, we could lose 90% or almost all of them in another 30 years by 2050. This picture is of a reef that used to be a brightly colored, living, thriving coral reef surrounded by fish and all the other creatures we talked about earlier. And now it is a pile of dead skeletons covered in algae. And we want to stop this from happening. We wanna keep our coral reefs. So I wanna quickly talk about some of the things that are threatening coral reefs. There are lots of things that can happen that directly impact corals, that break corals. Sometimes people don't know corals are animals. They look at them and they think that they're rocks and that they can stand on them and climb on them. And if lots of different people are standing on those coral polyps, they squish them, they kill them, they break the corals. And if there's a lot of visitors to an area, that can really add up and do a lot of damage. Ships, if they don't have the proper maps or mapping systems on their vessels, can ground onto a coral reef, which means to crash onto a shallow coral reef, causing a lot of damage and breaking a lot of coral. 
and <clears throat> large ships and boats can throw anchors onto corals accidentally, not knowing there are coral reefs below them, breaking and killing corals. And then hurricanes, which cause big waves and wind and strong ocean currents can whip across coral reef areas and cause a lot of damage as well. And this picture is Hurricane Maria that swept across Puerto Rico just two years ago. Unsustainable fishing can impact coral reefs. Taking too many fish or not taking proper care of the <clears throat> fishing tools that are used. Nets and fishing line can get caught on corals and break off pieces of corals. And fishing traps like this lobster trap here can get lost and become what's called a ghost trap. And ghost traps can just roll across coral reefs with the ocean currents and create lots of damage. Pollution from the land, from roads that are unpaved or development practices where the proper measures aren't taken to control sediment and dirt running off land can cause all of that dirt running down rivers and streams when it rains and running right onto a coral reef and smothering it. Also, using fertilizers and chemicals on your lawn can cause nutrients to build up on the coral reef ecosystem. And those nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus can cause algae to grow and smother corals like you can see in the picture on the right hand side here. Just like people, corals also get diseases as well. But unfortunately, unlike us, right now with the coronavirus, we can practice social distancing. We can stay apart from each other and prevent the spread of the disease. Well, corals unfortunately cannot move. They cannot practice social distancing. And so they're susceptible to diseases. And right now in particular, there's a new disease on this side of the world in Florida and the Caribbean that is killing over 22 species of corals, affecting them and causing a lot of coral loss. And this is actually what I spend a lot of my time working on these days is trying to work with coral reef managers and scientists to figure this new disease out that's called stony coral tissue loss disease and to try and find a cure for it. Climate change is affecting our coral reefs. Climate change is causing the seawater to get too warm. That map on top shows <clears throat> is a map from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch program, which keeps track of sea surface temperatures. And the areas that are darker red and orange are areas that are too warm for coral reefs. And so this program helps to warn managers when coral reefs are gonna get to, when the water's gonna get too warm, and they should be keeping an eye on their coral reefs and looking for that, that phenomenon that I mentioned earlier called coral bleaching. And I'm gonna show you guys what a bleached coral reef looks like. We're going back to American Samoa. I'm going to try to make this large, but it won't show me the expansion screen. Well, we're just gonna look at this picture. Um, this is a reef of a cropperid corals growing in an area called Airport Reef in American Samoa in that American Samoa National Marine Sanctuary. And this reef used to be brightly colored, very brightly colored. But now you can see that most of it is paled or completely white. And that's because the zooxanthellae that we talked about earlier, the algae living in these corals, got really unhappy because the water got too warm and the zooxanthellae left, causing the coral to look white. Now, right now, these corals are probably still alive. And if you look closely at a bleached coral, you can see if it still has live, clear, soft polyps in it, or if it's just a hard skeleton. Now, if the, zooxan if the water cools off quick enough and the zooxanthellae come back, the corals will survive. But if the water stays warm and too warm for a really long time, the zooxanthellae won't come back and those corals that need the zooxanthellae to live will eventually die and we can lose those coral reefs. And I wanted to quickly show you some coral reef skeletons. And so these are what a coral skeleton looks like. And if you've ever been to an area where they have coral reefs or live in an area, you may find pieces of coral like this on the beach. This is a skeleton from a brain coral. And you can see how that coral grew 
See those lines where the polyps were down here at one point and they built that skeleton up to grow bigger and bigger. And here's another example of a coral skeleton from a maze coral. And you can see all those little holes in there where polyps used to live. But this is what a dead coral looks like, a coral skeleton. Okay. Another threat to coral reefs caused by climate change is ocean acidification. <clears throat> climate change is caused by the release of too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and our oceans absorb a lot of that carbon dioxide. And that actually changes the chemistry, the chemical makeup of the oceans, causing the ocean to become more acidic, causing the pH of the ocean to change and get lower. Now, many of you may have recently done or have done before an experiment in school where you actually take an egg and you put it into acid or vinegar. So if you take, if you haven't done this, try it and you can see actually the concept of ocean acidification at home. Any old regular egg, brown or white, doesn't matter. And you put it in a jar of vinegar like this and you let it sit for two days I had this jar totally full. Don't screw the lid on too tight because it needs to release the carbon dioxide gas that gets released from the chemical reaction. And after two days, the shell, the calcium carbonate shell of the egg dissolves. And this is what you get. This is an egg with no shell. It's very soft and squishy and it's unprotected. And if I drop it too hard, which I did on my kitchen counter last week, it splats all over the place and that egg loses its protection. So same thing happens with a coral reef and other animals that have shells in the ocean. When the ocean becomes more acidic, even though it will never be as acidic as that jar of vinegar, um, it can prevent those coral skeletons from growing in the right way, or it can even in the photo, as you see here, dissolve the shells of many animals. So those are some of our big threats to coral reef ecosystems. Now, all is not lost. Scientists and managers are doing so much to save coral reefs, to protect them, to keep them around. We have fisheries management and fishing regulations in place and special fisheries enforcement officers to make sure people don't take too many fish. We have watershed management where people are looking at those areas where too much dirt may be running off of hills or development areas into the ocean and onto coral reefs, and they're planting grasses to stabilize that dirt. We have scientists working to treat coral reef diseases and apply medicines to, to halt the disease. We have coral restoration specialists. Here you can see a forest of corals being grown, of of staghorn corals that will be replanted out onto the reef someday. Remember when we talked about, it was a really good question that one of you had about uh, when coral bleaching can occur in an area, can some corals bleach and some corals not bleach? Well, those corals that don't bleach when there's a warming event and all the other corals are bleaching around it, we're, we're taking those corals and taking them back into the lab and trying to understand why those corals are super strong. And scientists are working to grow super corals, corals that can survive climate change and will be able to repopulate the reefs with those corals someday. And another really important tool to protect coral reef ecosystems are marine protected areas. These are special areas in the ocean where managers draw a box around that special area and say, we need to do something different inside of this box because the ecosystems and the habitat and the creatures found inside of this area are special and important and we need to treat them that way. And so NOAA has many marine protected areas and we have a system of national marine sanctuaries. We, we, earlier we saw the American Samoa National Marine Sanctuary and this picture shows a map of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary found right here in Florida. If any of you are familiar with Florida, Miami is up here and Florida is a long peninsula that goes above here. And the Florida Keys are a series of islands that extend down from the west, southwest from the Florida peninsula. 
And this whole area in this black box is a marine protected area. It's a sanctuary. And there are special rules in place there to protect the coral reef ecosystems and protect the creatures that live there. So now I'd like to hear your thoughts on the things that you think you might be able to do to help coral reefs. So let's take the last few minutes here and hear some of your ideas on based on what you've learned about what corals are and how important they are, what's hurting them, um, how you might be able to help. Okay, Dana, so we've got a few, a few people had come up with ideas while you were um, speaking. And so one was, you know, could we put buoys um, around coral reef areas to warn boaters that there's coral reefs so they know to be careful? Um, someone else says we should, Hudson says we should, you know, work on global warming. Or Ali says only wear coral reef safe sunscreen. James says don't pollute and Hudson agrees. Um, Maya says buy sustainable fish. Anya says don't use fertilizer on your lawn. Um, so let's see, don't boat near the reefs, um, which is a, a great idea from um, Brenner. Um, eat less seafood. Um, tell other people about what we learned today. Ellie says don't throw things in the ocean, even accidentally. Use less plastic, says Allison. Um, we can, and Kyle wants to know if we can plant coral. How are all those? Great answers, you guys. Those are amazing answers. You have learned and know so much about corals and what we can do to help them. And yes, you can plant corals. Those, those coral forests I showed growing earlier are all going to get outplanted onto real coral reefs. And so you can't plant them like a plant grows in dirt, but you can actually grow coral fragments and you can cement them down onto a coral reef and they will continue to grow and create a large healthy coral reef. So here's some of the things that I came up with on how you can help a coral reef and you guys already covered so many of these. You know, to stop car to stop releasing too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and to stop climate change, we can drive and fly less. We can eat less meat. We can buy local food and save our energy, use renewable energy and plant trees that absorb carbon dioxide. We don't have to use those pesticides and fertilizers in our lawn, especially if we live near water. And we might not live anywhere near a coral reef. We might live near the Mississippi River. If that water full of pesticides and fertilizers washes down into the river, it could eventually make it to a coral reef. Choosing sustainable fish. There are, we can eat seafood, but we have to be smart about what kind of seafood we eat. And if you go to fishwatch.gov, you'll get a lot of information on good, um, sustainable species to eat. Support those MPAs. Don't throw your trash in the ocean and help clean up beaches and coastal areas by joining or organizing a beach cleanup. And you guys are all now coral reef experts. So it's your job to teach people about how important coral reefs are and what we can do. And yes, use those mineral-based sunscreens or a rash guard instead of any sunscreen at all. So if you want more information on coral reefs, here's the website I was telling you about. You can, and it's also on the webinar announcement, www.coralreef.noaa.gov forward slash education. If you go to that site, you can print a 3D coral polyp on your own if you have access to a 3D printer. You can visit that interactive coral reef I showed you and learn all about the creatures on a Caribbean coral reef and get access to lots of coral reef activities, cool videos, materials, and your teachers can even find lesson plans there for your whole class. I wanna say thank you to some of my colleagues in NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. I have a, a great team of people that work in this program across the US and the territories as well. But these folks here helped me out with this presentation today. Jennifer Cause is the director of the NOAA Coral Program. Robin Garcia is our outreach and communications coordinator. Mary Allen is our social science coordinator and she studies how people use and need reefs and are impacted by the loss of reefs and the things that we do 
to protect reefs. And Brian Beck is responsible for most of those amazing photos that you saw in my presentation today. And thank you to all of you. Um, we're going to email everyone who registered for this webinar a certificate to show that you are now a coral reef expert and you participated in this coral reef ecosystem webinar. So thank you all so very much for taking the time to learn about coral reefs today and to share the knowledge that you have about corals and what we can do to protect them. And that's great. It. Thank you, Dana. Um, we are right at time. So I don't think we're gonna be able to take any more questions, but I just wanted to remind folks that all of the links that Dana mentioned, uh, Grace got them all up on the website for you. So if there was anything that you didn't get time to copy down or you're worried about going to find more information, that's all there for you. And um, we think the certificate that Dana developed for this webinar is pretty cool. So if you think so too, let us know. Um, we will be emailing those out to you after the webinar. And so uh, just a reminder tomorrow on Friday, we are talking to Kyle and Lou about big ships bringing things that you need into port. And that is gonna be a really cool webinar. So make sure you sign up for that one. Thank you so much, Dana, for your time. Um, we really appreciated hearing from you. And um, I think you answered Mateo's question, but I want you to know he did send one in. So, um, <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> all right. He well, can get all the information he wants on coral reefs, I'm sure. He's downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much again. Uh, we'll see you Friday. Thanks, everybody.